Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Jim Brosnan. I'm one of your hosts here with Tennessee Turf Tuesdays. Uh, this is our April edition for 2024. Hard to believe that uh, we've been doing this for five years now, but it's certainly been a series that we're proud of, and it's been fun to see it grow uh, and bring on great, great guests to talk turf grass. And, and today is no exception. Uh, we're joined by Eddie Harbaugh with the Philadelphia Eagles. He's going to give us a, a behind-the-scenes look at everything that goes on with maintaining surfaces at uh, Lincoln Financial Field. Uh, we had a great conversation with Eddie, a little, little so lively that I forgot to click record uh, for the first uh, several minutes of our time together. So we're going to be joining uh, our conversation kind of uh, as it evolved with Eddie, talking about Bermuda grass uh, on Lincoln Financial Field and their choice of using, using Bermuda grasses in Philadelphia. And then we'll be off and running and we go from there. It's a, a lively discussion that kind of goes to all angles of what they do for surface management and couldn't thank uh, Eddie enough for his time. So I hope you enjoy. But it's it's credit to um, the, the varieties of Bermuda grass that have changed. Um, you know, the research that has, has gone into it and learning. I mean, every year we learn. Um, we've, we've gone through a couple different uh, cultivars of Bermuda. And, you know, it sounds pretty um, challenging, and it is. But, you know, with the improved um, science that's gone into it and different cultural practices that we've learned and implemented and the resources we have, um, it's been really, really successful for us. And it's been um, the ideal grass choice at both Lincoln Financial Field and across the street at our practice fields. And uh, that's that's attributed to, you know, Tony's experience and success. And then also the organization. I mean, we are a pretty busy, we have a pretty busy schedule, but with that, um, we work for a great team, a great owner, great leadership that that gives us the resources that we need so we can grow Bermuda in the Northeast. Um, you know, we can get into that later, but it goes anywhere from, you know, sub air um, in the stadium field to, to heating, um, the technology with the growth blankets that we use and uh, different soil sensors and monitors that we can really dial in and figure out the best situation that even though we are in the Northeast, um, we do have the resources to kind of succeed and, and do it well throughout the year. So Eddie, to, to expand on that, what variety or varieties are you guys managing and how did you come to settle on those specifically? sounds like you tried a few things. Yeah, great question. So we, uh, we've changed a lot over the years, uh, going very, you know, over a couple different varieties. Right now, we currently go between um, Tahoma 31 and Northbridge. Uh, we had, you know, Latitude, Riviera 419, you know, in the years past. Um, but right now, um, Lincoln Financial Field is uh, mostly Tahoma 31, which is one of the newer, newer varieties out there. And then at the practice fields, um, it's a seven acre practice site, all Bermuda grass, about four and a half acres is Northbridge. And then recently, two and a half years ago, we took the other, um, section of the field and made that to Homa 31, which is really good to see side by side comparisons on the differences. And uh, although we've been had that for a couple of years now, I always joke that before I make my real determination, I want one more year, one more year to see, you know, before I pick one or the other, but there are two really, really good grasses that both do really well. Um, both have really good qualities to them. Um, you know, if one went away, the other one would be a great replacement. But right now at the stadium, Tahoma 31 is what we use um, throughout the season. So any any overseeding or? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we start off the year with just straight, uh, straight Bermuda grass. And then as, you know, the, the weather changes, we do overseed. Um, what time of year that is, it kind of changes. We, you know, we monitor the weather throughout and then make that decision on when to overseed. Um, but we do start off straight Bermuda. Years ago, uh, Tony went from Bermuda in the beginning part of the year throughout the summer months. And as the season progressed, um, he would switch to bluegrass. And it worked really well for a lot of years. I think the last time we did that was 2017, 2018. Um, and it worked really well. But as we got closer and closer with our sod farm providers and the quality of the sod farm and kind of I mean, we're very fortunate that our sod farm that we predominantly use is only 45 minutes away in Jersey. Um, and as we've gotten closer with them, we really found um, that we're most comfortable keeping the Bermuda base and then overseeding a mix of bluegrass and ryegrass into that, as opposed to switching just straight to a bluegrass field. Um, so in short, uh, we start off at Bermuda. 
and then we transition to a, a overseeded uh, Bermuda base, still to home of 31 with a mix of bluegrass and ryegrass. I mean, and that's got to be interesting too, the mix of the blue and rye because of the differential speed kind of germination, right? It, it, a little rye goes a long way. Like, did you guys have to play with ratios of how much blue to rye to get it to be what you are hoping for it to be on game day? Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're still changing ratios and learning that way. Um, we've really only started mixing in the bluegrass a couple of years ago. It was uh, predominantly just overseed with ryegrass and it worked great. Um, but we're trying to, uh, adding the bluegrass, it's, the goal is to help the sod structure um, just support that Bermuda base as well. Um, the ryegrass obviously does the major hauling, uh, much heavier rate of the ryegrass comparatively to the bluegrass. But we found that the, 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 the subtle mix between the two has performed really well for us as we get later in the season in the cold months. You know, one of the, the I guess, pest management things that a lot of the southeastern fields that overseed face, you know, they've got to have pretty thoughtful, uh, particularly POA programs around overseeding. Do you guys do anything herbicide wise or chemistry wise around that overseeding event? Um, and that can include spraying it out, you know, you, you, or do you transition with a sulfonyl urea or, or, or something in the springtime once it gets to the time of year where you want to do that in Philly? Yeah, it's a really good point. So I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, the the POA is a de definitely a big issue when it comes to over overseeding Bermuda grass. Um, we used to oversee the practice facility with ryegrass. And then we've learned kind of as we kept going with the POA control and kind of spraying out the ryegrass year in, year out, trying to transition back, you know, after the winter months, um, we decided to stop overseeding the practice fields. So NovaCare, our practice facility, does not get overseeded at all. So that helps us when it comes to the POA control. So we can treat that a little differently. Um, we, we, you know, spraying pre-emergence, you know, once that Bermuda absolutely shuts down, goes dormant, kind of protects us through the, the winter, the winter annuals. And then once we get going again, we, you know, put another pre-emergent and focus on the goose grasses and the summer annuals. Um, but transitioning over to the stadium side of things, it all depends what our event load is. So a lot of the POA control and the overseeding um, takes place at the sod farm. You know, I know you mentioned, you know, the bluegrass to ryegrass ratio. That's, again, kudos to our sod farm and, and you know, Tony working close, closely with them, trying to figure out and communicating, hey, when's the best time to overseed, you know, what rates, um, different herbicides and control methods for the POA, trying to keep the sod as pure as possible. Um, so kudos to our sod farm. You know, we always joke that we're only as good as our sod farm and, you know, once it gets here, you know, then it's our turn to kind of to show. But there's a lot of effort that goes into it at the sod farm before it gets to the stadium. Um, as far as, you know, post-emergent after the, the sods at the stadium, say after the season, um, if the schedule allows and we do have a grass event on the first half of the next season, um, we do spray out the ryegrass. So we'll use, uh, you know, many different chemicals out there, but, you know, Monument or Katana, or any one of those areas that, you know, wipe out the ryegrass for us. And um, so that obviously in turn takes out all the POA as well. So it, uh, it works out really well for us. I think a big part of it was uh, at NovaCare when we transitioned from overseeding slightly. And then we kind of realized that, wait a minute, we're kind of just doing this for aesthetics. And uh, once we learned and communicated with the coaching staff and the players that, hey, you know, this field is going to be dormant. It is going to be brown. Um, but once we communicated with that and told them and they've seen that the structure is still there, um, they've actually really preferred it over at NovaCare. They don't mind the brown, the brownness of the field. Um, obviously, a different scenario at the stadium where, you know, we do have to overseed. And um, with us having Eagles games, and I don't think you mentioned, I know you said other sporting teams, but we are home of Temple football or Temple University as well. So with the wear and tear from both having an NFL team and a collegiate team playing, um, we are forced to overseed and um, fill divots with ryegrass seed and try to get that growth back up. And we had a question while you were while you were chatting there, Eddie. You, roughly, when you're overseeding, I know it's done at the sod farm in most places. Any idea on overseeding rate? Yeah. So when it comes to the bluegrass ryegrass mix, we keep the bluegrass like a one pound per thousand, um, and the ryegrass is more than a four pound per thousand rate. So, you know, together blended, it's it's a really uniform base for us. 
And uh, with the Bermuda actively growing in the beginning halves or the beginning half of the year, and even with our soil heat and our growth blankets, um, we can keep that Bermuda going pretty long. So um, we start off at that rate. We definitely do add add seed after every game, um, but we monitor it. And uh, you know, we're we have the crew and a, a really great crew that that we walk the field after every game with divots, mm -hmm. and that divot mix obviously has seed in it. So we're always constantly replenishing it with fresh seed. Um, using the tools we have to regrow. But we start off at that lower rate, and then, um, again, we kind of feed it as it needs it throughout the year based on the wear. Um, no no season is the same that I've learned so far. I mean, you might have three games back-to-back, -back, um, and then you have a, a month break. Uh, with us having two different teams playing at the same stadium, we don't often get those breaks, but sometimes they do happen. Um, just touching base, like you mentioned, Tony being in Brazil. So that's week one, the NFL announced that we will be in Brazil and it is our wow. home game. So as soon as that's announced, you know, all the fans and my, my dad's like, Oh, Eagles home game in Brazil. I'm like, yeah, well, I look at it from the grass side of things. That's a home game. That's not played at this field. So yeah. right off the bat, you know, that's a game, you know, that a home game that, you know, one of our nine games this year that I'm already looking at the schedule. We all are looking at the schedule kind of planning, okay, well, if week one we're home, you know, once the schedule comes out next month, we can kind of really plan out and communicate with the sod farm when we need to oversee um, how much. And, and so it's all weather and schedule dependent. And you say you're filling divots after every game. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's very admirable. And that's one thing, you know, at the end of a one o'clock kickoff to go out and fill divots. But like, I mean, if you have a Sunday night game, are you guys doing that after a Sunday night game that's ending at midnight or later? Yes, absolutely. We, uh, wow. unfortunately, the, the, uh, we've been very fortunate to be a, a pretty successful team over the past couple of years. Um, I know the end of last season didn't go too well for us, but um, with that comes a lot of primetime games. So Thursday night, Monday night, Sunday night, um, we do have those late games, but at the end of the day, um, next week's coming quick. And even if you're not home next week, the week after is coming very quick. Quick. So um, we all know in the in the grass side of things that the quicker we do our job and put that seed back out there and put the fertilizer that we need out there and the growth blankets and do everything we can and then kind of let it do its thing from that point forward. So um, it might be a... a overthinking in the hair and say, Hey, an extra 12 hours is an extra 12 hours, but doing it immediately after the game is just added time. It's bonus time. You know, we, we, our goal is to try to make that field back to the way it was before the game was played. Obviously some wears integrated in there throughout the game, the, the play, but um, as far as cleaning up debris, overseeding, um, if there's any foliar sprays we have to go out there with, um, you know, we try to do everything to set that field up. So we can kind of just rest it and do its thing and let the natural grass take toll and just run off with it. So we can kind of just sit back and let it work. And how, like, will you run into situations where you guys are Temple Saturday, Eagle Sunday, back to back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So wow. uh, that happens quite a few times throughout the year. Um, and it's a catch 22, right? So it's it's a lot of, of wear on the field. It's a lot of labor. It's strenuous for the for the crew. But on the bright side of things, when you look at the, the large scale, if you knock out two games in one weekend, that might free up a weekend later in the year, both, both personally and, you know, with the health of the field. That could be a whole sure. week break that you get later in the season. So um, pros and cons to every event. Uh, it's very tough when we go from a Temple game Saturday to an Eagles game Sunday. Uh, there's been times where Thursday night football or a Temple game, Sunday night Eagles game. Um, so there's definitely, definitely different challenges that come with all the scenarios, but I get there's pros and cons to all of them. So how in the, a scenario like that, how would you all do the, the painting piece if you were painted for temple on Saturday and then you have the Eagles on Sunday? Great question. So painting is a really big aspect of what we do. Uh, it really is. Um, it starts off with the, the organizational branding. Uh, logos are a big thing. We are the Philadelphia Eagles. We want the logo to be bright, loud, and proud and, and represent who we are. So it's a really big aspect of, you know, when it comes to TV viewership and representing the brand. And the same aspect, you know, our job is to ultimately put the best playing surface out there. So with that, we have to monitor how much paint we do put out. Um, 
different weather dependent games for example if it's going to rain um and then we know it's going to rain two days prior to the game when we should be painting you know if we want to put one more coat of paint out there to brighten up the logos and make everything vibrant you know that might look good for the brand but for the game the, the game of football if that paint never dries or cures appropriately you know it could cause for a slick footing or the football um the football being slick i know we've communicated with our players a couple times and you know they've they've found that the paint can be slick sometimes so we monitor that and there's different tools um and knowledge and experience with just really diving into the to the, the machines we're using the paint nozzles we're using um being careful about how much paint we're putting out the pressure um just communicating with everyone on the crew about you know putting a nice even paint make it look good but we also can't we got to watch out for the plant health um so in reference to temple games uh we have a really good partnership with them and we will not paint temple logos if they play before an eagles game okay. so we will only leave our eagles logos out there um that's just to um again overall player player safety and the the structure of the field we don't want to be forced to a situation where we have to resize a logo um, mm -hmm. you know, just for that. So we have a really good partnership with Temple and they work great with us and it goes both ways. You know, we try to help them out. If we have a, a off weekend for Eagles and we can put a logo out there, we absolutely will. And, you know, for their homecoming games and, and we try to dress it up for them as well. But painting is a really, really big part of what we do. Yeah, no, for sure. We, we had a, a question while you were touching up on painting. Um, can you speak a little bit about mowing frequency? Like are you guys, you know, cause you got to get on there and paint. And obviously there's a, 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 a workload to doing that with string field out and stencils and, and, and whatnot. And then time for the, the paint to dry. Uh, somebody asked in the Q and a, how often do you guys mow? So we mow, uh, the short answer is we mow daily, um, every day. That's, uh, it can vary throughout the year. Um, throughout the summer, especially over the training field, sometimes it's twice a day. Um, and that can be because the grass needs it and it's growing, or it could just be after a, a player goes out there for warm ups or there's a workout or a practice, we kind of just mow it to knock everything back down um, and clean things up that way. In regards to the stadium and, you know, balancing between what we have to do to the field outside of mowing, mowing is always a challenge, you know, like you said, wet paint top dressing, sand, you know, there's a lot of different things that go on to, uh, go into it. Our goal is to mow every day, um, even the later halves of the season in the colder months, you know, with our growth blankets and heat, you know, we, we are actively growing and we're growing quickly. So it does need a mow. Um, but again, it comes down to the common sense side of things and really, you know, the less is more mentality. It's like, okay, well, it might need a mow today, but as, if one more day of growth blankets is going to be better suit, you know, maybe we'll leave those blankets down for the day and then just catch up on mowing the next day. Um, so we mow very frequently. Um, height of cut varies throughout the year. For Bermuda grass, we really don't go much below a half inch. Um, we've kind of played with it a little bit, but we found a, a half inch for, you know, where we are in, in the climate works out really well for us in the summer. And then we uh, transition you know, no higher than seven eighths of an inch, I would say, throughout the football season, even with ryegrass overseeded. Yeah, no, and I and I think it's always interesting when we talk about sports field management, and particularly that you know I hear you describe kind of your cultural practices regime. And again, it's you know somewhat just kind of a broad brushstroke look at it. Um, but you know what's implied but not stated is it you know it, it's not like you're using lots of herbicide or lots of fungicide to keep the field where we need it to be, you're kind of checking every agronomic box, right? Like all the other agronomic boxes that we can have are checked. And from doing that, you know, kind of your overall pest pressure is probably fairly low. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a really good point. Uh, you know, your, your one of your first questions was managing Bermuda grass in the Northeast. Um, you know, I, I joke with people a lot, you know, it's, our biggest problem in the summer, in the heat of the summer, is keeping paint bright because the grass is growing so quickly. <laughs> and I say that as the biggest problem at that point, but really if you dive into it and look at what the plant's doing and how quickly it's growing, it, there's, there's problems that can arise if you just let that happen. 
Um, so I know PGRs is a great way to kind of monitor the growing, the growth of it. But, you know, we've learned over the years and we've played with PGRs a bunch. Um, but again, I, I, I go back to the cultural practices with Bermuda grass is really beating it up. Uni raking, verticutting, top dressing is really, really big. Um, constantly going out there and monitoring, you know, where that cleat surface interaction is, you know, watching the players play, you know, on game day, a lot of times I miss the, the AJ Brown 70 yard touchdown because we're watching the, the tight ends feet or something along those lines. So uh, <laughs> we're always watching it feedback from the players. Um, Tony's done a great job building a communication between the team and himself. I um, mean, all of us kind of just saying, Hey, how'd you like to field um, any input, you know, uh, it, it goes, it's, it's really helpful, even though their lingo sometimes might be a little bit different, you know, it's, you kind of, kind of decipher, you know, what that means is, oh, the field feels soft or it's slick, or I really like it. It feels firm. So we kind of, those terms might translate something differently on our sides of things. Um, but again, back to the cultural side of things, we do a good job pest management wise, um, in, in all assets of if we really beat up that Bermuda grass, keep it lean and mean, kind of monitor how thatchy it gets throughout the year, throughout top dressing and verticutting cutting and uni raking. Um, it's, it really helps us throughout the year. So even though we're growing and paint seems to be the issue, there's work to be done to be done to keep that the only issue because the Bermuda grass grows very aggressively and we can, it can, it can lose sight of it pretty quickly. Hmm. So Eddie, we got another question in the chat. So, um, let's say worst case scenario, right? You have games back to back days. You have a lot of rain. You get just an extreme level of wear and tear on that field. How do you turn it around and get ready for that next day? What does that look like? It's a great question. So I think to start off that, to answer that on the first hand, I think it comes down to scheduling and experience in the schedule. Um, and it's kudos to Tony and, and everyone here, the, you know, operationally and everyone in the organization, when that schedule comes out at the beginning of the year, you know, we already have our collegiate football schedule. We have our summer event schedule. When that NFL football schedule comes out, we look at what we have on the table. So with that, you know, if we have seven or eight games on the field and you have a two week break, the field might not need to be replaced, but it might be the right time to replace it to prevent that later in the season we don't ever yeah. want to be in a situation i'm sorry go ahead no i i just was going to say i was going to ask you about this i'm assuming you, there's a lot of sod on plastic happening at this field a lot of sod on plastic yes yeah. yes and uh, kudos to the whole side i mean sod on plastic has been a, a really really big part of what we do and but it's it's the scheduling is you know if we had that back-to-back -back game later in october so you know we see that on the schedule and if we have that break earlier in the year we might do that resod earlier just to prevent that that crisis moment, weather dependent, what happens. So sometimes it's a, a communication challenge. Like, hey, the field looks great. Why are you resodding or why are you replacing or why are you doing this? Well, it's it's all preventative, looking at the future, looking at what we have coming up. And again, that weather variable is always can always be there. So we always have to look out for that. The the sod on plastic thing is just so interesting. We had uh, our colleague John Sorok and, and Trey Rogers from Michigan State on last year, you know, talking about the World Cup because right now at UT it's all things World Cup, you know, FIFA World Cup. Um, as we we prep to have, I don't know, Becky, two hundred plus pitch managers in here in in a week or so. Yeah, we'll have two hundred and fifty folks total across stadium managers, vendors, all kinds of folks involved in that endeavor. So, and, and one of the things that that. John and Trey talked about obviously was the sod on plastic piece and how that's like so central to what the World Cup prep will be. And, you know, I, you know, in, in knowing both of them well and talking with both of them, you know, I, they both kind of agree that one of the things that might come out of this whole World Cup endeavor is like sod on plastic just becoming even more common, right? Um, you know, they're, they're charging me next week at this event to talk about herbicide use. For some of these fields and you know my message is going to be like i'm not so sure that you need any right because when we think about weed seed well it's in the soil well if we're going to grow sod on plastic there's you're kind of removing the soil seed bank from the the whole equation right so it, it'll be interesting to watch post world cup if that just becomes more common with more people producing it yeah this the sod on plastic and then again back to the sod farmers 
they do such a great job. And, you know, I think it's communication with both, you know, internally in the organization and, and everyone, you know, externally, it's, you know, we can't just snap our fingers and have this, this professional quality sod at our disposal. There's a lot of work and a lot of prep and it's kudos to, to every sod farmer out there that's putting in the investment to, to get it to our level. And we're very fortunate with ours that we're, we're very close and work closely and have worked closely for a number of years. Um, where it, it's, we really we really benefit from them. We had a real specific question in the chat, Eddie, about um, uh, bill bug management and kind of just an insect and insect management. Do you guys do anything specifically insecticide wise or IPM wise for bill bugs or any other insect pests? No real bill uh, bill bug issues uh, for us. Um, as you mentioned uh, moments ago at the stadium, it's you know. We're turning that over so much. I mean, soil wise, it's we're not doing much at the stadium because we're constantly turning that over. Um, emphasis on the cultural practices there. And, you know, that's more on that avenue at the practice facility. Um, we, we do do a spray once in the summer. It's more of like a, a beetle issue, a, June, a green June beetle issue for us. Um, it's, it's really not becoming an issue because we've been so good um, throughout the years just with all of our, our practices. Um, believe it or not, uh, the biggest issue insect wise might be like anthills. You know, the players are out there warming up, you know, and anthills out there. It's really not uh, desirable, but we're really fortunate that um, we, we don't have many insect, you know, issues. Wow, that's certainly good to hear. So I've got a question. Um, you you mentioned earlier, you you use the phrase grass event, right? When we have a grass event on the field. Well, that implies that you have non-grass events on the field, right? And can you just talk a little bit about what is a non-grass event on, on the field? I Is that like a concert or or something other than a like a, I don't even know. Yeah, so we use the term grass event. We always love the grass events because, uh, you know, i.e. soccer, lacrosse, football, obviously. Um, it's grass events mean we have more control and we can do what we do well professionally as turf managers. Um, so we prefer those, but with that, they do come a lot of non-grass events. For example, right now, uh, right outside that wall in the, the stadium field uh, is concert flooring and a stage being built for WrestleMania. So this weekend we have two nights of WrestleMania WWE. I'm not much of a wrestling fan myself, but I've learned a lot over the past couple of days that, it's the Super Bowl for wrestling, and it's it's quite the production. Um, so that's classified as a non-grass event, right? So um, that's one of many that we have this year. Um, backtracking a little bit, just throughout, you know, just this on, in twenty twenty four, it's we started off um, out of the winter last month with a soccer match. We had Argentina El Salvador. Um, as soon as that game ended, flooring went down, and they started the build for WrestleMania. Um, so that's taking place this weekend. Immediately after that, uh, two weeks after that, I guess, is um, WrestleMania gets taken down. And then we start, um, we have the build for motocross and Monster Jam. So we, we like to cover all the, the facets here. We go from wrestling to motocross and Monster Jam. And uh, later this year, we have uh, Memorial Day. We have lacrosse championships. That's a grass event. Um, and then right after that, we have more concerts. You know, we go from uh, Kenny Chesney to Pink, Rolling Stones. Um, we have we cover all the bases with different uh, artists and genres, and we're very well rounded here at Lincoln Financial Field. I bet you that has to be a major change, right, over your time there. That like twelve years ago, would you do like? a handful of grass events a year and now it's more of a regular or excuse me or a handful of non-grass events a year and now it's a more regular thing yeah it's definitely getting more pronounced i would say um i will say though you know we've learned as an organization and and scheduling that you know when, once that flooring goes down how can we be more effective and and financially smart about it to okay the flooring is down for a concert you know we have kenny chesney you know june 8th let's put another one coming up right behind them and kind of make them back to back and do it in a smarter way. And obviously it's easier said than done, um, you know, scheduling with all these different um, events and concerts and trying to make it all work. Um, but for example, this year we have um, lacrosse championships, Memorial Day, like I mentioned, 
-hmm. right after that, before that field comes out for concerts, like, hey, how can we capitalize on this? They brought in another grass event. Um, they have top golf taking place, you know, the following weekend right after lacrosse championship. So because that field was in there, they said, okay, here's a good event we can bring in that might bring in some revenue and allow fans that might not be able to come to every Eagles game a chance to, you know, uh, you know, I might be a golf fan. I can step foot in Lincoln Financial Field and swing a seven iron off the top deck. It sounds pretty cool. So they'll still hit off the deck or off the, you know, the the concourse or whatever onto the field. Will you guys be putting out painting target greens or whatnot for them to do that? Yeah, yeah, we'll be putting out uh, greens, you know, painted greens for that. And it's, uh, I think it's eight or nine holes surrounding the stadium and uh, different pin locations on the field. And it's a, it's a really cool event, you know, especially a family oriented event for people to come out and they've done it across the street, the Phillies and, and many major league, you know, ballparks, you know, across the country. It's a really cool event. And it's just, again, a good example of how you can kind of lump events in, you know, when, you know, based on the schedule. So back to what you said about, you know, how it's changed over the years. I don't think people were hitting seven irons off the top deck of stadiums, you know, years ago, and now they are. And you can do it in a safe way and an effective way. So it's it's really cool yeah. to see what they come up with. Yeah, that's cool. No, uh, that it's definitely. I don't think I don't think Top Golf in stadiums was a thing twelve years ago. Um, going back really quick before we move off the non grass event thing. So say you have that scenario, you got Kenny Chesney back to back nights, right? And it's fields under concert flooring. Is that an automatic field replacement, or is that a we're going to try to recover this because it's Bermuda grass and we know that the recruitment potential is going to be pretty high. It's a really, really, really good question. It's um, something we get faced with every year and it's uh it's really time dependent and schedule dependent time of year with the weather. Um, in years past, we've had a winter classic game that took place in February or early March or I forget exactly when it was, but the point is the weather cooperated and it was cold. The grass was dormant, you know, our heat system shut off. We were able to keep that field covered for a long period of time, take that flooring back up. And we were able to play when it came to Memorial Day and have a successful lacrosse championship on that field. Uh, Monster Jam, if that's just a three-day event, um, three, you know, one-day event, but a three-day build and teardown, you know, we can allow and keep that field based on the time of year in early April and keep that in. But it goes back to Becky's point or, or someone that asked that question earlier. It's we can do that, but we have to be realistic about it and know that even though as turf managers, we really want to do this and try to bring it back because it's a fun challenge and it's, it's probably a pretty good chance we can do it. You also have to be pretty professional and smart about it that, you know, if this schedule is coming up and there can't really be what ifs. So we, we have to really be careful and look at the schedule and and look at the experience and learn from the experience that, you know, from the events we've had had in the past that, hey, is this can we do this? Can we keep this field, you know, based on the weather and the time? Or is it the smart move just to be safe and, and replace it? That way there's no questions. Well, and I've got to think, too, that, you know, speaking about changes over a 12 year arc, that some of the safety testing and testing protocols that are in place now that that weren't back then have to help with those decisions too, right? Because like, it's a balance of, yeah, we could grow the grass back in, but we can't do it at the sake of Devontae Adams or A.J. Brown trying to make a cut and suffering a non-contact injury, right? Absolutely. And all those testing metrics really, really help. Um, the NFL does have testing protocols that we follow. Um, you know, we'll submit 48 hours before every game, um, different moisture levels, field hardness levels. Um, traction levels that that have to fall within guidelines and it's a really good tool to help you know guide and make sure there's uniformity throughout the league but at the end of the day it's you know we can use those tools even though when we're not submitting the test to kind of gauge where we are but it's really being you know feet on the ground every day you know getting a feel for the field experience with the time of year events you know College games are different than NFL, but at the end of the day, we have a pretty good idea of how many games take place that where we really got to look at these testing metrics might fall out of range and we got to do something about it. Yeah. So, I, oh, go ahead, Becky. Oh, sorry. I, I was just, Eddie, I was going to, we had a couple of questions in the chat about drainage and, you know, this is kind of a loaded question, but obviously stadiums like this that are being used in the way that this stadium is being used, they've got some unique infrastructure 
to them to facilitate these non-grass events and to facilitate drainage and, you know, all of these things. Can you speak a little bit to that for our audience that may not be as familiar? What are some of the unique attributes of this field that allow you to be dynamic in this way? That's really good to touch base on. So I'm glad they asked that question. So um, we are sand, sand based root zone. Um, underneath that root zone, we have over 120 miles of glycol heat pipe that we can control our soil temperature throughout the year. And then with that, we also have a sub air system. And what a sub air is system is, is uh, we are able to control moisture levels in our field. So we can pull moisture out when we want to. And then we can actually, um, you know, for example, in the summer months when, when temperatures are high and soil temps are high naturally, not caused from our heat system, you know, we can turn those blowers opposite and cool our root zone as needed. So we have soil moisture sensors in the ground um, throughout the field. Um, so we can constantly monitor the, the heat and temperature um, levels. And with that, there's also um, a database of protocols and measures to, to ensure no mistakes happen. So if a boiler were to malfunction and something were to um, overheat, you know, we have systems and alarms in place that if anything gets above, you know, 75 degrees, that whole system shuts down and we're notified. And that's, um, you know, kudos to the, the technology changing, you know, even in my short time since I've gotten into this, is the tools that we have now to monitor just the soil heat, the temperature, moisture, salinity. Um, it goes on and on uh, how much sunlight we're getting in throughout the stadium. Sunlight's a really big thing in the stadium environment. You know, there's microclimates that later on, later on the year, you know, our south end zone doesn't get the same sunlight that our north end zone does. So using these tools to help monitor, uh, it really helps us. And, you know, yes, we have heat. Yes, we have sub air. We can control what we can control. Growth blankets are a big part of that. Um, we have touched base a little bit with growth lighting um, years ago. It's a little hard for us with our schedule. Um, we don't really have the time to put the lights on and off as much as we would like. But again, technology has changed. And years ago, it was the high pressure sodium bulbs that um, were the, the lighting source. And now the LEDs are integrated in different light spectrums. And it, it helps different um, you know, cell division and cell elongation. So lighting is a big part of it. We don't really utilize lighting too much here. Um, but as far as back to what you said, Becky, it's uh, our soil is sand-based, play call heating pipes, sub air controlled. So we really have all the tools we feel we need to really get the field optimal. All right, so I got to geek out now that I, I've learned all this. So you can heat the, the the root zone in the winter time. So is it a scenario where you're trying to keep that root zone as warm as possible to keep that Bermuda, uh, alive is not the right word. It's not gonna be vigorously growing because the air temperature is cold, but like try to keep the root zone as warm as possible. Is it a balance of, well, we want it to go fully dormant, so we're going to let it get pretty cold. You know, or does it mirror what, say, golf course superintendents do that are managing Bermuda grass greens, where they know, like, all right, there's a lethal temperature, right, where I can lose my tiff eagle or champion or mini birdie. And, you know, in a golf world, if the soil temperatures are going to get, you know, below, say, 25, guys will put covers out. They might use um, pine straw and a cover or double covering. Do you use the heating system to stay above like a lethal temperature threshold? Can you elaborate on that? So I'll, I'll touch base on two different sides of it. So over across the street at NovaCare, our practice fields, I know I mentioned Bermuda grass. Years ago, we did cover them throughout the winter. Um, we have since recently decided not to cover them throughout the winter. And there's a couple different reasons why. Um, just naturally, we feel that letting the plant do what it does go into dormancy in a natural state has really benefited us we're very fortunate for football that we don't start on the early part of the year i know we have otas um, which are optional training um, activities taking place coming up in a couple of weeks but as far as aesthetically and structurally we don't have anything where we really have to dress it up for early in the year so we decided to let that happen naturally even though if we do cover with growth blankets we might get early green up we found that you get that weird cold night, you know, a week or two after we green up and it just kind of shocks the plant back down. So um, over and over care, no growth blankets. We let that happen naturally. 
Um, the stadium, you know, it's definitely not crank it as, as high as you can or as what the optimal high level is. It's a balance. Uh, it goes back to just disease pressure. Um, we have these tools, but, you know, if you don't use them appropriately, you can create your own microclimate of disease. And, you know, if you if you combat the or add the 75 degree soil temperatures in January with our heat system, with our growth blankets and the excess moisture, <clears throat> excuse me, moisture levels, that's a combination for disaster. So rather than just pumping it with a bunch of fungicides, um, you know, we try to do our best controlling it. You know, if, hey, okay, we keep the soil temperature at 68 degrees, you know, not quite that 75 or 78 degree mark. We're not trying to duplicate the summer months, right? We're just trying to get that plant. And at that point, we're really focusing on ryegrass and bluegrass for the predominant part of that. Um, you would be surprised. We surprise ourselves sometimes when we do see that Bermuda actively growing. Um, but we all know it's, it's or many of us know, it's the, the hours of daylight is a big part of that too. And with us not using that artificial lighting, um, the Bermuda is awake, but it's not actively growing. So soil temperature wise, we really try to, we don't push the limits too far because um, we're constantly taking the blankets on and off. We have moisture sensors, like I mentioned, underneath the field, but we also have some on top. We'll keep some on the side where the blankets aren't. And then we'll put some underneath the blanket so we can kind of see, okay, the moisture level is here under the blanket and it's, you know, three points lower outside the blanket. So that might be time to pull the blankets off, maybe mow just to sheer knock the dew off or moisture off the leaf tissue because disease is a really big, uh, it can be a really big issue. So it's a constant battle with that. Um, just putting eyes on it, getting a feel, um, you know, and oftentimes, you know, if you get carried away with the heat system, go to the playability side of things, you know, you might think that you crank that heat up and try to get as much grass to grow as possible. But come game day, that might just create a, a, a soggy field that's not that firm. So we can even fluctuate that soil temperature, you know, from Monday to Wednesday, and then maybe dial it back a little bit throughout the week as we get closer to game day, just to kind of monitor that the firmness of the field. And again, back to player safety. It's a little bit of the art and the science mixed together there, right? Yeah, it's we have all the tools, but you got to do it appropriately and and learn about these tools and see, okay, I can do this. I can make this crank up to, you know, whatever temperature I want. Um, but and to touch base, what you mentioned about overwintering, you know, say when our season's over, um, we, we shut the heat off again, back to that natural state. Um, financially, I don't think it makes sense to, to run it or we don't think it makes sense to run it all winter long. Um, you know, if you start crunching numbers, like, hey, I'm going to spend this much to keep the heat system running. I mean, environmentally, it's not really the best thing to do when let's just see what we can do when it, we break winter and see how we can get this thing back in action. And you you guys haven't had any winter kill events up there or, or loss of Bermuda due to winter conditions? Winter kill? Um, no, not really. Our biggest battle um, disease is more of a disease pressure with spring dead spots. Um, that's our biggest issue for us personally when it comes to Bermuda grass in the Northeast. Um, we've done numerous things to try to um, lessen that issue. Um, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I remember reading somewhere along, you know, and once I got my first spring dead spot episode, I, you know, dove in full, full steam ahead and tried to research and learn as much as we can. And um, we found that the, the older your strand of Bermuda grass is, the more tolerant naturally you are to spring dead spot. Um, and that's really takes place for us over at across the street at NovaCare. Um, but with that, there's, you know, thatch management, um, pH levels. Um, you know, we are city water with our irrigation and we have an acid injection system to monitor the pH levels. Um, when we do fertilize, you know, we try to keep things lean and mean, but when we do fertilize, you know, using more of a monocle or ammonium sulfates to try to lower that pH level and, and try to help things in that regard. Um, you know, quick, funny story, just what I've learned with spring dead spot is, you know, we have a bunch of valve boxes that run in between our two fields and there's electrical boxes and things like that for practice, quick couplers. And, you know, we call it the gauntlet when you're on the air fire. Well, we, you know, I'll be the first to admit it. I'll just ride to the left and right of that gauntlet just to eliminate, you know, disaster hitting electrical boxes or quick couplers. I did that for four or five years. Wouldn't you know the spring dead spot was just in that spot where I didn't airify because it was, it got so thatchy 
and it got yeah. out of our control. So it was a really good learning experience for me personally seeing that. Um, and just, you know, maybe I should have went that extra mile and flagged out those valve boxes and punched some holes and diluted the thatch. But um, well, I would the, say winter kill, not so much, but spring dead spot, yes. Yeah, and I would say that the, the you know, the, you noted earlier kind of maybe flares of warm temperatures in early spring, right? And, and causing the Bermuda grass to kind of wake up and then it gets hit again. I know a lot of the folks that battle spring dead spot in this region, you know, typically from a fungicide perspective, it's a it's a two application program, and those applications are fall focused at a at a critical soil temperature that's escaping me at the moment. Um, but as we've seen, kind of warmer Januarys and warmer Februarys, there's been kind of an emerging question of like, does this need to become a three app program to provide that kind of extended coverage? And I can imagine for you all, you know, particularly in a in a situation where you can keep the root zone temperature elevated because of the ability to have heating like that's a variable you know uh, in terms of what's the right program look like on top of the agronomic stuff that you're already doing yeah it's a really good point it's uh for us we we for that soil temperature you mentioned we're in that like 58 degree mm -hmm. soil temperature you know for three days in a row at like a two inch depth it's kind of what we monitor and say okay you know, it might be time to put our first application out for spring dead spot fungicide wise. Um, and at the stadium with the heating, it's it's different. Um, and it goes back to our field getting replaced and spraying out the ryegrass and spring dead spot. And surprisingly, um, Tahoma, I don't know if this is true or not, but our Tahoma 31 has not had had the, as much spring dead spot pressure as our Northbridge. Could just be a one off something that we've seen here in Philadelphia, but that's what I've seen firsthand, at least. Now watch next year we might get spring dead spot on Oklahoma, but for now Absolutely it's where we clobbered. Stand. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think that's an important point, right? That that I think often we lump these Bermuda grasses together as oh, it's hybrid Bermuda grass, and that they all kind of do the same thing. And there's nuances between all of the cultivars. And like in, in my world with herbicides, we see this all the time where there's you, know, you pick up a herbicide label, it says, oh, it's labeled for use in hybrid Bermuda grass, but tolerance isn't universal across the board, right? That you may see a different response on Tahoma or Tifta or Tif Way, and that's just inherent because the grasses themselves are different too. It's another really good point. I mean, I know for me firsthand, um, you know, Primo, for example, a PGR growth regulator, you know, I've, we've sprayed that on our latitude 31, and, you know, at first it, uh, latitude grass i'm sorry and it it reacted differently at the rate mm -hmm. that we used and you know i right away i was like no i don't want pgrs or we don't want pgrs on our bermuda bermuda hybrid bermuda doesn't react well and then you know a couple of years later we dabbled more and you know different varieties to your point can handle things differently so it's not just blanketed all together as one so it's a really really good point so I've brought up real quickly here for those listening because we're coming to the end of the hour but this is for our golf course superintendent friends. So for GCSAA education points, as a reminder, this has nothing to do with uh, pesticide accredi accreditation of any kind. This is going to be your event approval code right here that you will put into the GCSAA website. Um, that code is 999-253-983-3605. Um, you will log that into their uh, event website to get your credits for today's session. And uh, if by chance you're either watching this on YouTube recorded or listening to this on Apple Podcasts, um, when you put this into uh, GCSAA's website, you want to make sure that you put the actual event date. Today's date is April 2nd uh, when you log that into their system to get um, to get the credits that you're hoping for for uh, golf course superintendent certification. We have one more question here. I can see in the chat. Um, so this is a really good question here, Eddie. So question is, if somebody wants to get involved with professional sports, what's the best avenue to get started? How did you, you know, what was your, your path, I guess, to get involved in professional sports field management? Yeah. So it's um, something is attending something is as simple as this, right? It's, we are such a close knit industry, um, you know, both on the golf side of things, landscape, uh, sports turf side of things, you know, our sod farmers, 
we all go to these conferences, um, whether it's the local chapters, you know, uh, for us here in, in Philly, it's CAPMO is our local um, chapter for our sports field managers. And it's attending them, being uh, networking. Um, and like I was going to mention to wrap up here, it's, you know, please share my information and, and Tony's information. We're more than happy to, A, do things like this. And B, if there's a question you think of at the end, please feel free to shoot a message and ask. We're more than happy to answer them. Um, even if you're local and you're, you're driving by Philly and you want to check out or answer some questions or see things, we are more than happy to just spread the knowledge of what we do um, and a whole as, as the whole industry. Um, it's our industry is growing um, so on the sports side of things and the golf side of things for us, player safety is bigger than ever. Um, there's a real emphasis on natural grass and just even managing synthetic fields and it's growing. So um networking, meeting people, attending perfect seminars like this, learning. Um, you know, I started off, uh, I, my first job was working for the Reading Phillies at um, a double A minor league affiliate for the, the Philadelphia Phillies. And I learned quickly that baseball wasn't my thing. I was, you know, I thought I liked this industry, but for me, baseball, I'm more of a, I like the football side of things. And, you know, I got my feet wet there. Uh, at Penn State, I, I, I worked for the Beaver Stadium grounds crew and got my first you know, not only football experience, but outside of that on all sorts of events. And I uh, kind of eventually ended up here, obviously, and really like where I'm at. But there's tons of opportunities um, on the residential side of things, sports turf, golf side. Um, just network, get your name out there. And uh, again, we're more than happy to answer any questions or even just a meet and greet. Yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And Becky, I don't know if you want as a as a closing uh closing a uh, piece of information on that note to talk about our fall event uh, that hopefully will provide some pathways for people to get involved in the industry. Absolutely. It's a perfect segue. So uh, University of Tennessee Turfgrass program is uh, hosting a new event this year. It is called Beacon, which comes from the UT alma mater. Um, our event is going to be September 12th and 13th here in Knoxville. It is not going to be a field day. It's going to be a two day event. The first day of which you can think of as kind of like a career fair. So our goal is that we have employers across the industry that are seeking uh, folks either for positions they have open or internship opportunities that they have. They'll come with those positions and get to interact with students both from our University of Tennessee Turf Grass program, as well as from several other other regional colleges here in the area. So we're really excited about that component. It's a great opportunity for people to network and explore career opportunities in the industry. And then our second day, we will open the doors to our research farm. We will have two themed research tours. We will have one that's focused more on sports turf. So you'll get to see a lot of the World Cup research that's being done here at the university by Dr. Sorokin and his crew uh, in partnership with Michigan State. And then we will also have a very golf-centric tour, which will focus a lot on Dr. Brosnan's research and Dr. Horvath's research and some of my research as well. So we're very excited about that. And uh, that event, again, September 12th and 13th, uh, falls just before a Tennessee football weekend. So you can stay through the weekend and enjoy a game here in Knoxville. Yeah, and, and and the for those listening, like there are more opportunities than there are students to fill, which is why we're hoping this event grows and, and we're you know invited students from across the country to or I should say across the region to participate. And there's just so much opportunity, Eddie, as you noted. And and you know, hopefully this event will maybe provide a, a pathway for those to get started. Um with that, I know we've we've taken a full hour of your time, and I know you're a busy a busy man, and a lot going on at, at Lincoln Financial. So, thank you for joining us. This was awesome, and uh, wish you the best of luck uh, this coming season, except when you play my New England Patriots. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and uh, really enjoyed talking. All right. Well, that's going to conclude our our Turf Tuesday for April. Uh, we'll be back next month, first Tuesday in May, with a whole nother session. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day.